My name is Nicole Malakowski, Colonel United States Air Force retired. I grew up in Central California in a small town called Santa Maria. It's grown a lot and so I think they'd probably call it a big town now. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom at the time. My dad worked in uh, construction and I hung out basically with my brothers and my sisters all day long in the backyard. Uh, can't say um, we had anything majorly exciting going on in Santa Maria at the time, um, but it was good small town living. I figured out I wanted to join the Air Force at a very young age. Um, when I was about five years old, my family went to an air show. And I remember seeing an aircraft, it was called the F-4 Phantom. A lot of people probably know that as the workhorse of the Vietnam War. And it came screaming by the runway, like really low. And I remember it, it like rumbled my chest and it was so loud, I covered my ears and I could smell the jet fuel and see some of the black smoke coming out of those old engines. And I remember just shaking like with excitement, right? Like when little kids get so excited, that was me. And I was thinking, that's what I want to do someday. And I had also grown up in a family um, that had military service. So both my grandfathers had served in the Navy. My father had been drafted into the Army during the Vietnam War. And so um, military service was something that was very respected, uh, considered honorable and noble in my family. I mean, we were the people that would go to the Veterans Day parades and that kind of stuff. So when you put together this kind of respect for the military service, um, combined with like this love of the power and the grace of fighter aircraft, you know, I was sold. I met a woman named Sue Ross, uh, who was my English teacher when I was a freshman at the Air Force Academy. Um, I thought she had hung the moon because she was the first Air Force woman pilot, right, that I had ever met. She was also my English teacher, but I remember her wearing those wings of silver and thinking, wow, you know, this is a real woman pilot. And then she took me under her wing um, and became a mentor of mine across my entire career. I mean, she was there for me when I failed check rides at pilot training. She was there for me when I became a Thunderbird. She was there for me as a squadron commander um, when I pinned on full bird colonel. And, and she was there for me when I got sick. Um, ironically, I moved to Colorado a year ago and Sue Ross actually only lives about two miles down the street. So she's been in my life since about 1993. And, and that's a pretty cool thing. I'm very lucky across my Air Force career, I had the opportunity to do a variety of things. Obviously, my primary duty was as a fighter pilot. So I flew in three operational fighter squadrons. I commanded an F-15E um, fighter squadron, and that was extraordinary, right? I had the opportunity to be stationed at RAF Lake and Heath in England twice. I mean, there really isn't anything cooler than flying up Loch Ness at 500 feet and 500 miles an hour in a strike eagle. I mean, life was definitely, um, definitely good. I really enjoyed career broadening um, when I went out and served with the 2nd Infantry Division um, as an ALO and a JTAC uh, with the Army, lived on the DMZ in Korea, which was amazing. Um, I did have the opportunity, of course, uh, to serve as United States Air Force Thunderbird. I flew in the Thunderbird number no. three right wing position for two years. Um, you know, just the privilege, of course, of a lifetime being able to represent all the women and men who serve across our Air Force and do it with the dignity and the respect that they deserve to go out there and just share the Air Force story and especially the opportunity to interact with young kids and, and teach them what's in the art of the possible, right? You know, especially within military service. Um, I also served at the White House two separate times, which is pretty unique. Um, the first time I was a major and I served as a White House fellow. I was hired under then President George Bush and halfway through we transitioned to President Obama. Uh, I think it's pretty unique because I was uh, helping out at what's called the Office of the President-Elect. So I was really like up close and personal um, watching the transition of power, you know, of the most powerful office in the world. So that was extraordinary. Um, and a few years later, I was brought back to the White House uh, as a full bird colonel to serve as the executive director of their National Joining Forces Initiative. Um, I worked directly for Michelle Obama and Dr. Jill Biden. Um, I had an office in the East Wing. It, it was wild and it was meaningful because everything we did at Joining Forces was in support of service members, veterans and military families across all aspects, education, employment, wellness and anything in between. So it was really meaningful and impactful work and to be able to shine a light like on our community um, at the national level was something special. Um, but hands down, the greatest assignment of my, my career uh, was the opportunity and the privilege to command the 333rd Fighter Squadron at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in Goldsboro, North Carolina. 
Um, that is the epitome, uh, the greatest honor, I think, uh, the biggest aspiration for most fighter, fighter pilots um, and fighter aircrew to have an opportunity to do that. Um, I loved leading airmen. I loved flying the F-15E too, but it's all about just the teamwork and leading airmen. And as a squadron commander, you're still, you're at a high enough level, but at a low enough level that you can make independent agile decisions and everything you do, right, is to help the individual like squadron member achieve their definition of success. And I, I just, I loved it. I miss being a squadron commander. If I could go back to any time in my career, it would be the 333rd Fighter Squadron. My military career came to an end very unexpectedly. Um, I got severely ill with a very rare and complex illness. I like to tell people that my career was gone in the blink of a bite. Um, I was actually medically discharged uh, under the diagnosis of late stage systemic tick-borne illness. So here I am, this you know fighter pilot that's um, led peers in and out of combat, worked in the White House, commanded a fighter squadron, flown as a Thunderbird, and one teeny tiny little tick bite completely um, broke me. Um, I found myself bedridden about 22 plus hours a day. I spent nine months unable to walk, talk, read, and write, and another year um, while I was in rehab um, trying to get back to independence and a quality of life worth living, which is what I have today. Um, when you're a bit of a medical mystery, it can be very draining, um, going to all the different doctors and all the different specialists, you know, trying to get TRICARE and my leadership to support me seeing people outside of the military um, medical system, and then, you know, fighting to keep your career if you can, going through the um, very unnecessarily complex and burdensome, burdensome in my opinion, MEB process, um, and all of that can be overwhelming. On top of, you know, your, your, in my case, my illness, but for all wounded warriors, you know, for your injury, um, your wounds or your illness, it's just like this extra, all this extra stuff, this administrative, you know, type burden that gets put on, on top. And that's where, you know, the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program for me um, came in. I was literally laying in bed um, because I couldn't really, you know, move. I was in a lot of pain. It was a uh, physical pain. It was mental pain. Um, the fact that I knew I was losing my career overnight and, and I didn't want that to happen, but the universe was happening to me, you know, and I was struggling with that, you know, who am I if I'm not wearing my nation's uniform? Who am I if I'm not contributing by flying fighter aircraft? Um, and that's when a friend of mine who I had met a long time ago um, approached me, uh, Colonel Buff Burkell. Um, I call her the Colonel's Colonel because she really is. She reached out to me and she says, man, you know, you've kind of fallen off the net. I haven't heard from you in a while. Um, you know, what's going on? And I just, she was the first person that had checked in on me. And I just kind of, you know, let go and, and invented and got a lot of emotion out and just felt a lot better. And she was in the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program. Um, she's kind of famous in the program. She endured a very traumatic helicopter crash um, where she had to rehab her neck and her body and her spirit, um, you know, and is still on her own recovery journey. Uh, but she reached out to me and, and that's where the first time I learned about the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program was at my lowest point. And I got to be honest with you, I told her, Buff, you know, Air Force Wounded Warrior Program isn't for full bird colonels. The Air Force Wounded Warrior Program isn't for fighter pilots. It's not for people who have illnesses. And I was wrong, right? Those are all myths. The Air Force Wounded Warrior Program is for everyone of all ranks and experiences, of all career functions. It's for everyone who's ever been wounded, ill, or injured in service. And so it took a little time for Colonel Burkell and the staff at Air Force Wounded Warrior to um, convince me um, that it was for me and that I did belong. Um, and the second that I finally gave in uh, and joined the program was the day that I think my life uh, turned around. Um, that's where I realized that I hadn't really been abandoned or, and forgotten. Um, I had a lot of administrative burdens with the medical system that the, the people within the program, the staff, stepped in and completely took off of my shoulders so that I could totally focus on my own healing, my own recovery, and, and my own plans for the future. And I think, too, you know, when you're a medical mystery and dealing with a complex and rare illness, it's like you're constantly fighting to get people to believe you or you're constantly having to explain yourself and it's exhausting. And within the family of the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program, I didn't have to do that. I'm believed up front. I'm accepted up front. It's clear that I'm welcome and that I'm wanted. And just to feel that 
when you're at this really low point in your life and you're losing your career and you're worried about how you're going to provide for your family, to have people say, we're here for you, here are our resources, call us anytime, let's get together and chat and share stories. It validates what you're going through and that means something. And so I often say that in a lot of ways, the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program saved my life and saved my, my spirit. And I believe that fully. I got to tell you, I look back on my career. I even commanded a fighter squadron. And I didn't even know about the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program. And so that's what drew me to becoming a trained ambassador is now I can go out across the Air Force and let our leadership know, let young airmen know. I mean, you don't have to be uh, in a command or a leadership position to refer somebody to the program. You can refer yourself. You can be an airman basic and re refer somebody else. I mean, I want to educate the Air Force, the active duty, reserve, all of that on the opportunities that are out there. And I really try because I get to wear that colonel's rank still. I try to talk to the higher level leadership, you know, about what the program can do and how it can help them lead their people better. People ask me a lot how I managed um, to reinvent myself. And the fact of the matter is, is, you know, I, I had to hit that kind of rock bottom. Um, I remember the day that my medical retirement came. I was um, at home. I couldn't walk safely. I was having a hard time, you know, speaking and reading and writing. And I was in therapy and there was no ceremony. Um, half of my documents, you know, for retirement came in the mail in a manila envelope. And I got to tell you, you know, that's hard. Um, and that, and that hurt. Um, and I remember sitting there kind of feeling sorry for myself, having a little bit of a pity party, which I think is natural, right? It's okay to feel sad and it's okay to feel grief, which is what I was going through. And then these words came into my head, like, you know, out of nowhere, depending on your beliefs, you know, um, these words just echoed and the words were yield to overcome. Yield to overcome at that moment to me meant um, it's not about quitting. It's not about surrendering completely and giving up. It was all about just pure acceptance of where I was in life, right? I didn't ask to get bit by a tick. I didn't ask to be sick with an illness that medicine currently doesn't have a lot of solutions for. I didn't ask for any of it. And, and yielding to overcome also meant, you know, forgiving myself and just letting go. Um, at the time I was thinking, you know, who's going to hire me? I can't read or write. Uh, I'm in severe pain. I have tons of fatigue. I can't work a full-time, you know, job. And I realized in that moment with yield to overcome, I wasn't asking myself the right questions. The right questions are, okay, Nicole, this is where you're at. What do you have right now that you can use to move forward? And I, I took stock of those resources. I looked at my toolkit and I actually had a lot in there, which included the support, of course, of the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program. And as I sat there thinking, well, the number one thing is my health right? The number one thing is my medical care, staying in my re recovery, staying in my therapy so that I can recover to the best of my capabilities. Um, and once that's done, I can move on to reinventing myself. And that kind of moment of reinvention, you know, that's really hard. And I discovered um, a Japanese tradition or a Japanese uh, thought process called Ikigai. And forgive me if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but it's this kind of way of being um, and I studied up on it and it connected with me and it was all about, you know, what can you do to have an impact, provide for your family and use your unique skills for the betterment of your community. And anybody who's looking at reinventing themselves, I totally recommend looking into this idea of Ikigai. And in there is where I discovered that the thing I missed the most, the hole in my heart, what I needed was being with people and leading people. And so I started looking around and going, you know, how do I fill that place in my heart? And during my kind of therapy, I had to regain um, a lot of memories. I had to regain my ability to speak. And in there, I started telling stories and vignettes as part of therapy that people said, wow, you've got some interesting life lessons. You should share those with more people. So when you put that together with this need to be with people, that's where I discovered, hey, why can't I be a professional, you know, leadership and motivational speaker and consultant? And so I set about doing that and I've been doing it for nearly three years now and it's been shockingly successful. And interestingly, I feel I am making a more positive impact more quickly on a far greater amount of people doing what I do now than if I had actually remained in the Air Force. 
I don't mean that like in a bad way against the Air Force, because in a lot of ways, I'm still out there advertising for the Air Force. And I, I share all my great stories and hopefully people are, are inspired to join the Air Force from that. But it's, it's just fascinating to me. I, when I talk to airmen, when I go out as an Air Force wounded warrior ambassador and I share my stories, I remind airmen, right? The Air Force is amazing, but you also need to know who you are outside of the Air Force. What gives your life meaning? What is it that you value and why? Um, and I don't think I had thought through those hard questions. So when crisis came, and it did, I was flailing a little bit. And so I encourage airmen, I tell them, look, someday you're not going to be in the Air Force. Maybe it's 30 years from now. Maybe, you know, you get out in 10 years. Maybe you retire of your own free will. Maybe they have a drawdown. Maybe, right, you get sick like me. The unexpected happens. If you know who you are and what gives your life meaning before crisis happens, then the transition and the difficulty is going to be a heck of a lot smoother and easier for you. And so that's kind of, you know, one of my one of my messages. At, at some point, all of us are going to be out of Mother Air Force. So who are you when that happens? Post-traumatic growth is very real. Um, I am enjoying the heck out of retirement. I told you three years ago when I was being medically retired, I, you know, I went out kicking and screaming. Uh, I was upset. I was hurt. Um, I, I didn't know what to do. And I look back now over these last three years and I think like everything that happened was supposed to happen. I used to think that my contribution to this planet, my legacy was going to be just the fact, you know, which is awesome that I served in the Air Force and that I was a colonel and that I was a fighter pilot. And I actually see now that all of those things and experiences and skills I gained in the military were exactly what I needed to survive my illness and were exactly what I needed to reinvent myself to where I am today. And the fact that I can still have impact on people in a positive way, even in retirement, is extraordinary because guess who controls her own schedule now, right? Me. Guess who controls her own workload? Me. There's something, you know, pretty amazing about it because I get to look back on my Air Force career and reminisce about great things, but I still get to look forward, you know, to all the things I get to do. You know, um, I'm very lucky that my small business uh, is going very well. Um, so as far as providing for my family and my future retirement and my extra medical bills outside of TRICARE, um, I can make that happen and, and there's no stress there. So that's a good thing. Uh, I get to catch up with my husband and my kids. Remember for two years, I was pretty much not able to participate in their lives in the way that I wanted to. So right now I'm making up uh, for lost time and that's extraordinary. And the thing that I spend the most amount of my free time on, and like I said, I don't get many hours a day where I'm, you know, fully functioning. Um, where I spend that is as a patient advocate. I've gotten very involved at the national level um, with tick-borne illness policy. So I work with the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm a part of the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. I'm on the board of the Dean Center for Tick-Borne Illness at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital in Boston, who saved my life. So shout out to them. Um, I'm part of the Live Lyme Foundation, the Center for Lyme Action, and it goes on and on because I realize that there are gaps um, in science. There are gaps in advocacy in the tick-borne illness space. And I can take all of those skills and strengths and character traits that the Air Force forged in me, that my severe illness forged in me, and I can turn it around for good. And we are making huge progress as far as research funding and policy change at the federal level. And that feels pretty darn good and purposeful. Um, and it gives my life meaning right now. I try very hard uh, to give voice to the voiceless. And I do that because tick-borne illness patients are like me. They're at home, bedridden, 22 plus hours a day, unable to walk, talk, read and write and advocate for themselves. And because of things like the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program, I was able to heal. You know, I still have a lot of, that I'm dealing with, but I was able to heal to a point where now I can advocate for those people and I can give voice to the voiceless and I can change the narrative around tick-borne illness in a way that prevents people from ever going through what I went through. 